this session, uh, we will consider a constitutional understanding of military officership. Presenting is Dr. Mary Beth Ulrich, Professor of Government, Department of National Security and Strategy, and General Dwight D. Eisenhower, Chair of National Security Studies at the U.S. Army War College, a 1984 graduate of the United States Air Force Academy. Dr. Ulrich served 15 years on active duty in a variety of assignments and continues to serve in the U.S. Air Force Reserve in the rank of Lieutenant Colonel. She received the MA and PhD in Political Science from the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. She has published widely concerning the relationship between democratic nations and their democracies uh, and their militaries and has lectured extensively at U.S. and international defense colleges and academies. Uh, there will be inevitably a degree of overlap between the talk we just heard and this one, but Mary Beth, I think, will focus us more on contemporary issues while still reaching back to that constitutional history that we talked about in the first period. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ulrich. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here in Newport. It's uh, my first time here, so I look forward to uh, see more of the War College and uh, its environs. And I thank uh, for the invitation to come here. And uh, every place I have ever taught, Martin taught there first. So I don't know if that means uh, my destiny is to someday live in Newport. I don't know. but. T time will tell. So as Martin said, uh, Jim Burke and I were given similar assignments, uh, overlap to a degree. Uh, we'll, I'll, be, I'll be touching, you know, retouching some of the ground he covered, but I think you'll see I going off in different directions in, in its um, ap 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 applicability. Okay, so I was asked to look at a constitutional understanding of military officership. And I will look at this uh, a little bit more in terms of civil military relations and the constitutional foundations of our uh, modern day civil military relations. So I will begin with the historical context and take us back in time and look at the Constitution as a national security document. And to keep in mind that our Constitution was really the second Constitution. There was a first attempt at a Constitution. And the reason that you know, the Constitutional uh, Convention came about was because this first attempt fell short. And of course, the fir first attempt was the Articles of Confederation. These were in effect from 1776 through 1788. And so the Articles kind of, it's, it's, it's interesting, we always gloss over that period, but I think the, the, it's interesting to look at the Articles because it gives us an idea of what, in the ideal world, what the founders would have liked to have gotten away with, if only it would have worked. Okay, so we'll look at that and then we'll see how they had to sort of give in to reality and change, you know, their first draft with the redo based on, you know, their historical experience of living, trying to live with it. So under the Articles, and, and, and keep in mind, they fought the war with the Articles of Confederation, okay? The first draft was approved in 1776. Uh, they wasn't actually ratified to 1781, but in the meantime, that this was the basis of the um, Continental Congress and and uh, its role in fighting the revolution. So under the Articles, Congress was the only, the only central branch of government, but it did not represent a national government. It could only coordinate the activities of the states. So all the states still re retained their, their sovereignty. Um, the delegates to the Congress under the Articles, they had to follow the instructions of their state legislatures. Any issue related to the financing of war had to be approved by nine of the state delegations. Uh, this Congress had no authority to raise troops or impose taxes. All of this power was reserved to the states. But the Articles did um, embody key elements of early American political culture. Um, a lot of this is some aspects that, that Jim has covered, but for instance, the fear of an oppressive centralized government, uh, great importance placed on the sovereignty of the individual states, the deep aversion to standing armies, which we have already talked about in great length, and the fear of national taxing authority. But the problem with this sort of idealized version of, of government was it simply was not working. It was clear that the weak central government embodied by the Congress was unable to prevent war, mount and sustain military operations should war occur, or even to prevent internal rebellion. A better balance had to be found to ensure security while preserving liberty. So 
So 11 years after the signing of the Declaration, in the wake of a nine-year Revolutionary War, and 11 years of ineffective governance under the Articles of Confederation, delegates from all the states except Rhode Island, and I meant to go back and find out why was it Rhode Island wasn't there. So maybe one of you, one of you know, and we'll, we'll clear this up on the break or something, but they all gathered in Philadelphia in May of 1787 to solve the problems of the First Republic. So the task boiled down to a fundamental problem, how to devise a government strong enough to preserve order, but not so strong that it would threaten liberty. So the framers settled on a political system with some key design elements, all of which represented an experiment in self-rule. First, a fairly strong central government, at least in comparison to the non-existent um, central government in the, uh, previously under an executive. So in the former, so they did create this single-person executive, which they were trying to avoid um, in the in the in the first case. Uh, they also uh, created a Supreme Court, which represented the judicial power of the United States. No such entity existed under the Articles. They tried to get by with just local courts in the individual states. They created a strong legislature with countervailing powers and the specific power to tax, borrow, and coin money, regulate commerce, and raise armed forces, all powers that the Confederation government had lacked. So the, final, the framers' final product was a careful blend of separated and shared powers. They deliberately considered the sort of institutional competencies they were attempting to develop when deciding which powers should be shared and which should be held alone. So closely related to the founders' fundamental problem of designing a government strong enough to preserve order, but not so strong that liberty would suffer, was agreeing on the role of the military in their design. Their dilemma in this respect represents the key concern of civil-military relations. The security of the state would depend on the creation and enabling of a military strong enough to protect it. However, an institution of such strength would also inherently possess sufficient power to overthrow the very government that established it. Samuel Huntington noted in his introduction to the soldier in the state that, quote, the ordering of its civil-military relations, consequently, is basic to a nation's military security policy. And he added, nations which develop a properly balanced pattern of civil-military relations have a great advantage in the search for security. They increase their likelihood of reaching right answers to the operating issues of military policy. And nations which fail to develop a balanced pattern of civil-military relations squander their resources and run uncalculated risks, unquote. So the, the founders were indeed very deliberate in their ordering of the young state civil-military relations. These constitutional foundations set the stage for the patterns of American civil-military relations that have transpired to today. Key to the constitutional ordering of civil-military relations was diffusing their fears of a standing army capable of overthrowing the government. The American colonists shared the English fear of, for, of standing armies, rooted in the legacy of Oliver Cromwell's military dictatorship of the mid-17th century. And again, wasn't that distant to them. It would have been like us looking back on you know, the 20s or World War I. <clears throat> um, and after this military dictatorship um, occurred in England, that began the advent of the standing armies in the service of monarchies across Europe. Indeed, the seeds of the American Revolution were sown in the Crown's policies of taxing the colonists, in part, to finance the garrison of troops in the colonies. The British troops were viewed as tools of the Crown to enforce unpopular edicts and to undermine colonial self-government. So the colonists settled on a post-war ordering of civil-military relations that retained key elements of the militia system while creating a small standing army of professionals expert in the preparations required for war and capable of countering the peacetime threats of the growing nation, such as defending the frontier. The founders employed the same method of countervailing powers that characterized the overall design of the American political system in the ordering of the civil military power. Richard Cohn, who will be uh, arriving at the conference uh, tonight and will be on hand for the next couple of days, he wrote about this extensively and quite elegantly in a book called The United States Military Under the Constitution of the United States, 
which was written on the occasion of the bicentennial of the Constitution in 1989. And Cohn said, quote, if the first line of defense against a standing army was to entrust its existence to the representative of the people, that is the Congress, the second was the central check that permeated the entire Constitution, division of powers. The framers divided power over the military so that no one branch was fully in control. Congress created the army, paid it, supplied it, made rules for its organization and governance, and otherwise determined its character and institutional structure. The president held the reins of command as commander in chief. Thus, the framers separated power over the military, just as they had in so many other areas of government. The two great powers, the purse and the sword, the latter, the most direct threat to liberty, were separated, but at the same time shared by the two branches." Unquote. So couldn't say it any better than him, so I thought I would share that with you. Furthermore, the legislature, which was granted the authority to raise forces over the president, I mean, it's as opposed to the president having this authority, <laughs> was structured as a bicameral body, requiring two separate houses to agree on the need to support and sustain an army. The founders further limited appropriations, as Jim earlier mentioned, um, to two-year intervals so that each new Congress could certify the continuing need for the army. And the final institutional check was the continuation of the militias and the concurrent authority that the Constitution vested in the federal government and the states over them. The framers trusted that sufficient, indeed overwhelming power at the time, if you think of the numbers of people involved, existed in the form of the individual militias to rise up, if need be, against a standing army engaged in usurping uh, liberties. So when it came to designing the American civil military order, the founders' top priority was to make it coup-proof. The colonists' distinct political culture along with the noble behavior of people um, who refrained from undermining nascent democratic institutions when they were in positions to do so, <clears throat> all of this contributed to forging an American civil military relations tradition devoid of coups. Now this we take for granted, but upon further examination, the patterns could have developed another way. George Washington was a key figure in institutionalizing the norm of civilian supremacy. During the war, he meticulously consulted with the Continental Congress and all its various committees. Remember, it doesn't was one executive to report to. He had to report to an array of committees and entities in the Congress. But he was very meticulous about this in the conduct of his duties. Furthermore, he resigned his command promptly at the war's end. The 19, I'm sorry, the 1783 Newburgh conspiracy represented a real threat of military despotism. And uh, Richard Cohen, again, has a great chapter just on this in his book, Eagle and Sword. So if you want to hear more about this, I bet it's in the Naval War College Library. But suffice it to say that this event had the potential to join the material interests of the army and the ambition of some political leaders to derail the new nation's democratic institutions at the time of its founding. Washington's choice to expend his personal and political capital to defuse the plot is an important model still relevant today. At such fragile moments of a state's life, when institutions are weak and untested, giving the nation's leaders the opportunity to pursue their own interests over the national interest, Washington's example still impresses. Our adventures in nation building demonstrate how rare these patriot leaders are today. Where is the George Washington of Afghanistan? Where is the George Washington of Iraq? So from these constitutional foundations come several first order principles of, American, of the American civil military tradition. First among these is the concept of civilian supremacy. Acceptance of civilian supremacy and control by an obedient military is the most important principle of civil military relations in democratic states and the core principle of the American tradition of civil military relations. U.S. military officers take an oath to uphold the Republic's democratic institutions. Their client, American society, bestows its trust and treasure with the primary expectation that the state and its democratic nature will be preserved. Civil military relations scholars have stated this principle a number of ways. Peter Fever's principal agency theory supports the view that civil military relations in a democracy 
are uniquely concerned that designated political agents control designated military agents. He speaks of the unequal dialogue between the civilian and military actors in this hierarchical relationship, which ultimately results in the civilian's right to be wrong. Fever argues that the premises of democratic theory mean that, quote, civilian political leaders have the right to ask for things in the national security realm that are ultimately not conducive to good national security. The military should advise against such policies, but the military should not prevent these policies from being implemented, unquote. Army Colonel Chris Gibson lays out his first, this first order principle in his new just published book, Securing the State. Gibson says, quote, the first principle is that elected leaders always have the final say and nothing is beyond their purview, unquote. He develops what he calls his Madisonian approach to civil military relations by applying the same principles of power, checking power and ambition, checking ambition that are present in the overall system to the civil military relationship. Gibson writes, quote, institutions with overlapping responsibilities that shared power and inspired the best efforts for those they serve is the very animating concept of the US Constitution, unquote. Gibson seeks to apply these constitutional foundations of civil military relations in order to prevent the accumulation and abuse of power by either set of agents, top level civilians or their military advisors. And he develops in the book he tries to take those principles and apply them in ways uh, to the development of officership and professional norms uh, to, to, to uh, rationalize why there should be competing sources of advice um, uh, within the military uh, with, and that the uh, civilians should have access to an array of competing perspectives. And this he couches as his Madisonian approach of, of um, you know, let them choose from uh, the, these various perspectives, let them compete uh, in the advisory process. And I'll elaborate on that a bit later. Um, in my own writing, um, I've applied these concepts to states undergoing democratic transitions. And I drew upon Samuel Huntington's competing functional and societal imperatives. Um, the functional imperative for Huntington was this idea that the military has got to be strong enough to, uh, it's gotta be organized in such a way that it can meet its, its objective, its reason for being, which is to protect the state. However, the societal imperative is that the process of doing this must not undermine the very character of the state. Uh, this would apply to any political system, but if you're talking about a democratic system, then it cannot undermine the democratic character of the state. So the, the resulting concept um, I call democratic military professionalism. And it argues that all, that professionals in all political systems share a mandate to be as competent as possible in their functional areas of responsibility in order to defend the political ends of their respective states. However, military professionals in service to democratic states face the added burden of maximizing functional competency without undermining the state's democratic character. Officers in democratic states serve societies that have entrusted them with the mission of preserving the nation's value and purpose. So all of this focus on constitutional foundations brings us to the challenge inherent across the centuries in implementing these principles in the conduct of national security. A knowledge of each actor's roles and responsibilities in the process is necessary to stay true to these first order principles. Unfortunately, recent scholarship along with observations of military and civilian participants um, indicates that, quote, senior civilian and military leaders often lack a common understanding of roles and responsibilities, unquote. This was the key finding of a recent study conducted by the Carr Center at Harvard's JFK School, which just came out last spring. Uh, it was a study that brought together flag-ranked uh, military participants, very high up in across a number of administrations, and uh, their equivalents um, on the civilian side and just got them to talk about what they thought some of the issues were um, and how they could improve civil military relations. And that was one of the key findings is that, you know, we just don't understand each other. We, we need, there needs to be more work done in terms of understanding the various roles and responsibilities. And I'll try to cover 
um, some of that ground now. <clears throat> and then others, as uh, Jim mentioned, who have pointed to various behaviors, such as DeCone has done a lot of this work, uh, being trying to provocative in his observations, saying, hey, you know, this, this behavior is out of line, um, or that behavior is out of line in terms of, you know, typically it tends to be either military overreaching or civilians overreaching or somehow um, at odds with these, these designated roles and responsibilities. So <clears throat> I argue that civilian and military national security professionals cannot, cannot comply with the constitutional foundations unless they understand the unique competencies and responsibilities of their positions. And these distinctions between competencies and responsibilities are related to the nature of the position and the constitutional authority upon which it is based. So, you know, to be very basic on this, civilians have the authority to decide, while the military actors have the obligation to protect the state in ways that don't undermine the state's national values and purpose. But it may be occasionally or even frequently um, that military professionals perceive that their competence or expertise in a given issue area is superior to that of civilian authorities who have the responsibility to make policy decisions in that same area. So this brings us to the ground covered um, a bit earlier, this argument that civilians have the right to be wrong. The military officer's responsibility is not to be right. It is to uphold the democratic processes that preserve the civilian policymaker's constitutional role and to provide the expertise necessary for sound policy and the conduct of effective operations. Furthermore, it is not the military actor's responsibility to decide the national interest. Although his or her expertise should certainly be factored in to the civilian policymaker's determination of it. The roots of coups in the developing world stem from the overreaching of military actors willing to implement their vision of the national interest, or perhaps just their own interests in less noble cases, in contexts where democratic institutions are either absent or too weak to stop the us usurpation of power from the civilian authorities. Now, James Burke pointed out in his review of theories of democratic civil military relations, um, which you can find if you do a ProQuest search in Armed Forces and Society, and it's, it's called something like that. Um, he said that mature democracy's number one civil military relations is not fending off coups, but of sustaining democratic values and practice. So military actors may decide to press for their preferences using methods short of coups, and in so doing, may still undermine democratic values and practice. Peter Fever dubbed behavior that, quote, does things the way those in the military want, unquote, as shirking. Instead of, um, quote, doing things the way civilians want, which he imaginatively called working. Okay, if you want to follow up on this in q and I'd be happy to point you in the direction of, of uh, those studies as well. So, so uh, building on this theme of uh, the real issue is sustaining democratic values and practice. Uh, this is also dependent on the quality of the outputs of the national security system, because poor strategic choices can result in national ruin. The founders understood this well, and this was why the decision to go to war was not left in the hands of a single actor, and specifically placed in the hands of Congress. Most scholars agree that today's strategic environment does not allow for a clear division of military and civilian spheres, at Hunti as Huntington had assumed with his theory of objective civilian control. Such a division would separate war fighting responsibilities from the policy decisions of the political elites. But in reality, the expertise resident in both spheres is necessary for strategic success that is required to sustain democratic values. Political agents are likely to have greater experience in the strategic and political dimensions of national security policy, while the military agents will be more rooted in the technical expertise and operational knowledge related to the use of force. But we need, them, we need the combination of that expertise um, in a hierarchical understanding of who, get, who really does have the authority to make such decisions um, to optimize our outputs in terms of um, strategic choices 
international security system. So while the Constitution allows for overbearing civilian control, such attempts to dominate the relationship, evident in the behaviors of Defense Secretaries McNamara and Rumsfeld, just to name two, um, can lead to dysfunction in the relationship and the undermining of the effective civil-military partnership needed for strategic success. So I'm trying to sort of paint this picture that there's certain things that we must stick to in terms of constitutional foundations, and it's a, a great guide, and they got that wired, you know, this whole thing about there's not going to be a coup in the United States because the system is really designed to make that pretty much impossible. But for the, for the country to survive, um, I, think there was a, I think there was a distinction between you know, living and living well in one of the articles. might have even been yours. Did you say that? The difference between just or surviving but surviving well, um, you know, without going and squandering all of your treasure in you know, needless wars and all the, the result of poor strategic decisions, um, that requires a partnership, especially, you know, in this post-war, post-World War II environment where you, where you have to have the standing requires the participation of a whole core of professionals dedicated to this um, to get their part of it right in terms of the expertise that, that they can um, provide. So I'd argue that national security outcomes are optimized when participants on both sides of the relationship commit their respective military and political competencies to the task at hand to collaborate on strategy formulation, execution, and adaptation. Colin Gray in Modern Strategy noted that achieving effective dialogue between a civilian national leadership and generals can be difficult. He said, quote, politicians and generals tend to lack understanding of and empathy for each other's roles. It is not so commonplace to notice that politicians and generals are often less than competent in their own sphere of responsibility, let alone in the sphere of the other, unquote. So an effective civil-military partnership involves understanding the mutual expectations of each partner in the relationship, expectations that are consistent with constitutional foundations. So an effective civil-military partnership requires giving special attention to mastering the military's advisory role. There are two key principles to convey to rising senior practitioners, and I would include you in that, in that group, um, about the advisory role of the senior military leadership in policymaking. The first we already discussed, that is the civilian political leaders are, are the responsible and accountable authorities. The second principle is that the military's advisory role is a professional responsibility. Civilians, for their part, should consider military advice when making policy decisions, even if the ultimate decision is a thoughtful rejection of that advice. I'll just give you a little anecdote um, that happened at the Army War College last year. Secretary Gates came there last year, and it was just a couple weeks after he had cut drastically back that future combat system, the Army's big program, FCS. And so a student asked him in Q&A, he says, how difficult was it doing that, going against the Chief of Staff of the Army's advice? And Gates replied, quote, it was the hardest decision I had to make, um, unquote. Oh, oh, well, especially since he knew that due to his consulting with the Army leadership, that they disagreed with it. However, the civil military partnership did not suffer a serious break because of that incident. Because the Army leadership could at least perceive that its advice was considered, very proactively you know, went and consulted with them, um, and the civilian leadership was taking other steps to manage the relationship in the wake of rejecting that advice. So, um, for instance, um, in that budgetary decision, Gates was very careful to say, you know, well, the reason I'm not doing this is because um, I think it's, it has to do with the specifications of this program. He says, you know, it's, it's, it's way too heavy, it hasn't really adapted to the needs of the war on terrorism, you know, but, I, I'm but I'm gonna give you guys, you know, many millions to try to get it right. So he didn't take it away from them completely. He said, you know, I just, he, looking at the national interest and what the current threats are, didn't think that decision was compatible, but said, hey, you know, here's some funds, go back to the drawing board and see if you can come up with something that does meet the, sec the security environment. And so, I would argue that in the wake of the Rumsf 
Feldian era, <laughs> that that was a conscious decision to really try to manage the relationship while still exerting um, civilian control and you know, having the top priority be the national interest. <clears throat> so part of managing expectations in the civil-military partnership is to accept the fact that legitimate disagreement may sometimes occur. So, you know, you, you, the, the, the Army leadership, they understand they're going to go back and they're going to fight another battle and, and that, you know, agreements will, will occur from time to time. So civilian policymakers want to keep benefiting from sound military advice, then they must be careful not to punish military actors who work within the established bounds of dissent. Military actors, in turn, should recognize when their act actions exceed the established bounds of dissent. One such line is when acts of dissent take military leaders beyond their roles as advisors to the civilian leadership to become political actors themselves. Military actors should vigorously advocate for their positions within the bounded limits of the collaborative policymaking process. This is especially true when more strictly military competencies are at stake, such as judgments related to evaluating risks to soldiers and advice rooted in military doctrine, perhaps related to troop levels for various types of operations. However, adv advocacy actions counter to the civilian leadership's known preferences begin to usurp the civilian leader's distinct responsibilities. For instance, efforts to influence the terms of debate in public forums while the administration is still deliberating, as I would argue occurred recently with the Afghan strategy deliberation, this may shift the military professional status from objective expert to suspect competitor. And again, that type of behavior then falls more in the category of damaging the civil-military partnership. And, and we can talk about this more in Q&A, but once you start pushing the limits, then it becomes a trust issue and affects the ability of the two sides to work together in, in the uh, national interest. Let's shift now to some discussion of uh, Congress. <clears throat> it's also important to keep in mind that under the system of shared civilian control, the military owes its expert knowledge to both executive and legislative authorities. For this reason, it is important to cultivate military congressional relations, including relationships with congressional staffers who often possess legislative expertise and may be influential actors in their own right. The Constitution empowered the Congress with oversight, budgeting, organizing, authority, and war powers. These powers were deliberately vested in the institution closest to the people in order to better sustain the legitimacies of policies relevant to the armed forces, especially in wartime. So the mil therefore, the military should balance its responsibilities to its dual civilian masters, and civilians should recognize the military's dual responsibility to give its best advice to both branches. Samuel Huntington wrote about the dilemma that this dual advisory role poses for the military way back in over 50 years ago in a soldier in the state. And this is what he said. If the military chief accepts and defends the president's policies, he is subordinating his own professional judgment, denying to Congress the advice to which it is constitutionally entitled, and becoming the political defender of an administration policy. If the military chief expresses his professional opinions to Congress, he is publicly criticizing his commander-in-chief, and furnishing useful ammunition to his political enemies. There is no easy way out of this dilemma. So uh, you may be interested in following up on this uh, in Q&A. But I think many observers argue that over, the American, that over time, American military professionalism has strayed from its constitutional foundations on the issue of the dual responsibility to its two masters. The civilian leadership, the civilian political leadership has shown a tendency to expect the senior military leadership to behave as if they were members of the administration, rather than as members of a profession, serving the entire United States government and the nation. So I have actually seen this argument um, extended when we start getting into this kind of whole of government approach to things and our strategic problems don't just involve the military and the Department of Defense, saying, you know, there should also 
the, the Secretary of State should also be entitled to expert military advice and, and every other relevant actor that needs that expertise to make uh, policy decisions central um, to the success of strategy. So restoring this professional norm um, to its constitutional foundations, I think there's a lot that we could discuss here and now and back in seminar discussion or whatever you want to do with that. Um, the last topic I'll take on is this issue of partisan politics. So when it comes to discussing professional norms re related to partisan political behavior, I usually have some standard principles that I like to advance, um, such as, uh, number one, the military should be able to serve either political party in a principled fashion. Second, ideally the military should be comprised of a representative cross-section of the population so that, so that it can be perceived to be of society as opposed to separate from society. Third, the perception that the military is overwhelmingly associated with a particular party undercuts its apolitical legitimacy upon which the military depends to serve society. The other potential peril is that the perception develops that the military develops institutional interests rooted in, ide in ideological preferences that inhibit its ability to serve the national interests. So these are the sort of cautionary notes I would normally make in response, um, you know, in a form like this, advocating various professional norms. Um, and in response to evidence that the officer corps is trending overwhelmingly toward a particular party, which happens to be, in this day and age, um, the Republican Party. And some go so far as to argue that officers today equate being Republican with being an officer. In fact, there's a new book just being published, I think it comes out next week, um, written by an Army Major, Jason Dempsey, who some of us have seen at various professional uh, forums, and he went on staff at West Point in the Social Science Department. He did a lot of surveys of cadets, and he, his book talks about this, but basically um, <clears throat> his bottom line is that he thinks it has evolved to that, that there's a certain amount of, uh, perhaps due to the self-selection in all volunteer forces, you know, any variety of reasons, that this is, has become an, an, um, a way of identification for officers. But in the interest of sticking to my assignment, which was to root my talk in constitutional foundations, I, I had to wonder, what would the founders think about those developments? And actually, Jim already kind of addressed this. But given their fear of standing armies, I said, I don't think they'd be surprised. Um, their fear was based on the assumption that a standing army would become separate from society and develop its own institutional interests, which taken to the extreme could result in overthrowing the government. So this was, they fully understood this, so this was what they were trying to stop, okay, with their institutional mechanisms to do so. Again, again remember their solution. Design sufficient checks to ensure that the power of a military institution would be constrained. In fact, the founders assumed the military would be comprised of different components. Um, a standing army, um, as Jim noted, which would expand and contract according to the threats of a particular time, and a, and a very sizable militia. And the citizen soldiers would populate the militias, and it was assumed that those actors would be of society, and that they would have political views. In fact, um, as Jim Burke notes in, um, in work I referred to earlier, um, the citizen soldiers uh, who fought to contribute to the success of democratic revolutions were given special status in their new republics. I found this fascinating. And, and, and to quote Jim, he said, they were living in a democratic order um, whose being depended on their sacrifice, and they claimed a right to determine its form. So the Constitution then may allow for partisan preferences in the officer corps. But as stewards of the profession, you should ask yourself if the trend is consistent with the end of sustaining democratic values. Um, most observers agree that, whatever you want to call it, the politicization, republicanization um, of the military coincides with the advent of the all-volunteer force 
and the simultaneous decline in mass participation in the armed forces, and consequently the role of the citizen soldier. Is this shift <coughs> um, from universal civic responsibility to choosing military service from among many various employment options um, in the long term, is this in the interests of the Republic? Does the possibility of strategic defeat loom because as a society we kept going back to the same non-representative segment of society, the all-volunteer force, time after time after time? And I think this is where the question in the Q&A comes in. You know, an environment where the vast majority of the population is not necessarily even connected to the major um, activities that the armed forces are engaged in, even when they um, constitute multiple wars. So in the end, this was an interesting exercise that um, Martin gave to me. He said, you know, think about these things in terms of um, constitutional foundations. And I found that it can be an effective way, you know, if you think reflecting back on the constitutional foundations, uh, can help us to ensure that our evolution of the concept of officership is consistent with foundational principles. But I also found that such a review only gets us so far when it comes to professional norms and officership. And that I think we're really kind of on our own for a lot of that ground and what will we'll, um, we'll get a lot of benefit from um, developing further this idea of sustaining democratic values. That is, what, what is the nature of civil military relationships that result in the most effective collaborating, working together, um, and you extend that out, uh, resulting in the best decisions we can possibly get um, for our society, um, and therefore, you know, leave our republic on the, you know, the best footing that it possibly could be and prevent us from you know, various uh, pitfalls that could you know, spell the demise. <clears throat> so in the end, whatever norms are cultivated uh, should keep in mind uh, these dual constitutional principles of both protecting the state and sustaining its democratic values. So with that, um, we can see what your questions are. <clears throat> Good morning, ma'am. Shelby Becker. A quick question. Do you sense or do you feel that there's an ethical requirement for the military to stand up to its necessarily subservient role to civilian control when the civilian control is pushing for something that we say we don't need or want. And a perfect example is the case of uh, C-17 aircraft that Congress is pushing the military to buy at two billion and some change apiece when both the Secretary of Defense and the military leadership has said we don't want it. That one seems pretty clear cut. A more difficult one where I feel we may have a requirement to stand up is in uh, the use of torture or something like that that clearly mm -hmm. steps outside of the bounds. Okay, um, starting with the, the first question. This gets back to what I was talking about, about the two masters. And, you know, I kind of glossed over this whole idea of, of dissent and, you know, what its limits are. But I'm, at the same time where I caution not to go too far, um, and in fact, another piece that I wrote with Martin several years ago, we sort of made the opposite argument too. On the one hand, you, you can make the mistake of overreaching, of advocating beyond the bounds of what's accepted in the realm of dissent, uh, but you can also make the mistake of underreaching. And that's where I, make, where I, where I, why I said, you know, the, the second principle I had about the advisory role, that it is the professional military's responsibility to advise. So the question is, how far do you go with this advocacy? And so what I would say, you know, and again, you got the two masters. So within the executive side, that would be, you know, advocate all day long, you know, behind closed doors within, while, you know, within the bounds of this policymaking process. So what would be out of bounds 
would be some of the things I talked about, you know, going to the newspaper, leaks fall into this. If, if the purpose of a leak is to get the military's position out there, and I think, again, this did happen in the Afghan strategy. Everybody knew what the military wanted, and they sort of boxed in the commander in chief, you could argue. Um, I mean, he had to deal with that in, in, in such a way he shouldn't have had to um, when, when making those decisions. I think that's a little bit more easy to understand on the executive side. I think the uncovered, gr the untreaded ground is more on the Congress side. Um, I would argue that this is an area, um, having gone through the whole PME system myself, that I think we don't do a very good job um, educating and socializing our officers in terms of their role, their relationship with the Congress. Um, and in fact, I think um, there's, we tend to socialize um, our officers in such a way to think they work for the president and that, you know, the loyalty is to the president and, and you know, and then, and then the other hand, the civilians don't understand their role because then they exploit that, as I mentioned in the talk, and, and at times treat military officers as members of their administration and try to make them the face of policy and things like that. I mean, a good example of that was what happened with uh, General Petraeus, who very much became the face of the surge in ways that may not have been consistent with the roles and responsibilities. Um, but I think what's underdeveloped is just the, the very legitimate role of going, of, of giving that professional advice to Congress um, within, you know, the standard settings of hearings. Um, and of course, there's, there, you can always give that, you know, frank advice, you know, not in public, but the, the, you know, the careful lines uh, to avoid are the appearance of lobbying, um, which is, you know, not allowed, but to effectively use these very sort of elaborate liaison structures, if you're familiar with that. I mean, every service has a very elaborate, you know, legislative liaison um, structure, which is their way to educate um, on issues. Um, and some say this uh, amounts, could amount to almost institutionalized um, Lobbying, but I'm actually I'm in favor of, of making sure that the, everyone who who is making a decision has the proper information upon which to make that decision. Um, so, in the case of um, as you as you gave it a specific example of procuring you know an aircraft or or something like that, um, the, the 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 trick is. The, that, that's the real dilemma, kind of the Huntington quote, got to that dilemma. You know, if you know the president, the, the administration is opposed to something, um, and once it's already been decided, and now you're going to go to Congress and say, you know, in your professional judgment, I know that C-17 is under the budget, but I'm telling you, you know, as Chief of Staff of the Air Force, I would really love to have 10 of them, you know. There, there's... It's really a dilemma because you're going to pay with the administration. You, you, you could do that. I mean, if you think that's your best professional advice, I would say it's in your constitutional purview to offer that professional advice, even after the decision has been made. But the cost will be that you'll pay some trust issues with the administration. I mean, they may punish you for the perception of not being loyal. So you have to decide what you're gonna go to bat for. I mean, this is kind of where the Shinseki example came in. When he went to, you know, he didn't go to Congress with any agenda to say, you know, I really think we need more troops in this uh, plan for Iraq. But when asked, you know, what's your best advice on this, knowing he had some good professional expertise in this area for all of his experience in the Balkans, he says, well, you know, based on my professional expertise, you know, the number, you know, looks low to me or whatever he said, you know, you need many hundred thousands of troops. Um, he sh and then the reaction was basically punished him. Okay, so, so a lot of this, it's, it's complicated because you, you have to look at, at what your responsibility is. He would have been wrong to have ducked the question, I think, you know, from an ethics standpoint, if they, that, that, that entity, the Congress, was entitled to get that advice. Now, the question is, what's the fallout in terms of the civil-military partnership and the civil-military relationship? I would fault the administration um, for poisoning the civil-military relationship um, with the way they reacted to 
what he thought was just giving his professional advice. And that then created a climate where um, other officers thought it was you know, career threatening to actually give their, their best advice. And I think at the end, going to the sustained democratic values theme <laughs> did not work out for us well strategically. And so that's one of the things, I don't, I don't know what's going on at the Naval War College, but I know at the Army War College this year, we are very focused on um, this period of the 2003 run-up and this whole re-examination of what were the civil-military relations and this sort of common perception that uh, the senior military leadership did not give their best military advice. And of course, it was a really tough environment within which to deliver it. I mean, the administration wasn't looking for it, but still, it's a professional responsibility. And uh, next year, we have this whole big theme we're gonna be doing on civil military relations and ethics, so we're, we're just a year behind you. But um, it's a good question, does that help? I mean, it's complicated. There's no easy, you know, that's why you have to have, I argue, you have to have these foundational tools, like you're getting at this symposium, so you can just think through those issues. And there's never just run really easy, you know, yeah, this is the answer. It's like, well, if I do this, I'm gonna have this problem, you know, and, but, but we, we're trying to give you some stuff to think about so you can fall back on the basics. And there are, there's stuff out there that I would say is just sort of misinformation um, or missocialization in terms of you work for the president, only the president. I mean, it's just simply wrong. It's not consistent with their constitutional principles and it's not what I'm sure the founders had in mind. <clears throat> oh, torture, I forgot about that. Okay, so what, what was the question specifically <clears throat> on that? No, ma'am, you essentially answered it. My only question was whether or not we have an ethical right or obligation to stand up when our civilian leadership is pushing for something we in the military don't want. Yeah, I'd say in that issue, okay, um, well, I think you know, I, I'm sure you've all been developed sufficiently. I, I know we all got good education on the issue of the illegal orders. If you think it amount, I think if you think it, if it rises to an illegal order, then then you must, you know, you know, react against that. Um, I think there was the, the issue with the whole torture thing. I and again, I have to go back. I think there's been some criticism of the leadership that they weren't. Uh, forceful enough and too much of this delegation to um, legal authorities to somehow justify it, you know, one way or the other, when if they had stuck to just the, the basics um, in that, you know, not following the Geneva Conventions, you, you know, I think, I think the, mil the military did speak up about this to some extent, but the fact they did not prevail. And so I think the whole issue is, well, should they have done more? And I think that that's, that's what you're saying. But they had a unique perspective on this because they understood that, you know, we cut the corner here, our forces could become the, the you know, because of the reciprocal acts that we are then subjecting ourselves to possibly. I think they understood that um, right off the bat. I know I've even heard General Myers, who doesn't have the reputation for being the most forceful advocate against administration policy, even he um, apparently um, spoke out against this, but the question was, you know, how far, did, how far did you take it? Could they have taken it farther and still stayed within the bounds? Seems to me that's probably a good example of that. If you went back and did all the research and say, okay, if, if here's the line, and if they were maybe back here a little bit, speaking out, but, you know, it could have still been more forceful advocates and not crossed the line and maybe had a different effect. <clears throat> Um, here. Uh, Captain Bill Nault, U.S. Navy. Not to, uh, to mince words, but when you talk, and you've talked about this a little bit, it's not complicated. <laughs> it's, it's complex, it's mm -hmm. hard, but if you take our basic requirement to defend the Constitution, then it's, then it's not hard. Each of you mm -hmm. just say, I don't have to go and stand in front of Congress or, or make that point. I use the example in my own head that, okay, don't tell me how to level the village in Afghanistan. Just tell me that's what you want and I'll tell you how the best way is to do it. That's my requirement. That's my mm -hmm. obligation. 
don't ask me if it's a good idea. It's not my, it's not my job to tell you, mm -hmm. civilian leadership, whether that's a good idea in the first place. You're supposed to be laying this out in your national security strategy, and that flows down to a maritime strategy and et cetera. So that's the, that's the problem I have mm -hmm. when I hear people wringing their hands about whether I should be telling Congress what I think. It's a technical answer. It's a technical business that we're in, and it should be a, and I'm, I know it's a naive answer, mm -hmm. a naive response in some ways, but that's what it should boil down to. It's a technical answer to a specific question or set of questions. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. my opinion. Well, I think, I think in that case, in issues where it can be boiled down to that, then it should be pretty cut and dry. I mean, the problem is, um, and that may be more true at operational level decisions perhaps, but when you get to the strategic level, there's very few things that would be that cut and dry. And that's why this whole Huntington model breaks down in terms of objective civilian control, this idea that, well, we'll decide and you guys just go do it because as, you know, warfare has become more complex, and I mean to say warfare, you know, just the strategic environment that we're out there using our forces and, you know, whatever it is, implementing the power, um, the, the, the problem is the, the civilian policymakers cannot come to the proper decision without some of this expertise that is resonant, even at the strategic level. Um, you know, because it may be, well, gee, we have this idea, you know, we want to go invade this country or whatever, okay, and we think it's going to be easy, you know, whatever, you know, some theoretical, hypothetical example that could happen maybe at some point in time, you know, but you would, you wouldn't, you'd want to know, well, gee, what would it take, you know, and, 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 and so if you're telling me, okay, that's, that's, I need a million soldiers to do that, now the politician's got to think, hmm, okay, well, we may have a million soldiers, you, you know, you're going to tell us what, what you, what you could do, and then they're going to factor that back in and say, hmm, that's going to mean I better really get my ducks lined up in terms of political support. This is not something I'm going to get away with just, you know, a short operation. We're going to have to get the Congress on board. We're going to have to do all of these things um, to sustain the effort. We've got to get the people ready, you know. But without that piece of information, well, yeah, and, it's, and there's a back and forth. There will be a back and forth. I'm say, you know, I really want to get this. I mean, I think a good example, I think, is the Bosnia example with the Balkans. And I think Colin Powell was faulted um, uh, for maybe not being straight, maybe with, with how he used, um, what I say, how he sort of, um, um, th this the way he used, he applied his expertise. When he, uh, when, when he understood that the political leadership wants to do something about that situation and they were willing to use force. Because remember there was that whole exchange between Madeleine Albright and um, Colin Powell and she, they were in some meeting and she's like, you know, she, she's like, oh, we're going to use the military, you know, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And, and, and she's like, well, what's this beautiful military if you'll never use it, you know? And then Colin Powell says something like, I think I almost had an aneurysm or, you know, whatever, whatever that quote was out of, his, out of his book. But the point was, he knew that the president wanted to do something about this problem and he, and he was prepared to use military power. The answer he got when he went looking for that military expertise, what would it take? And like, oh, this would take, you know, a couple hundred thousand troops. You know, there's no way, you know, we knew there's no way we were going to do that, you know, in that situation. But, well, it turns out there really was a broader range of options. Because three years, you know, several years later, we did the, you know, the air, the air campaign, which was probably in that, bag of options years earlier, you know, so I would say, and that's a perfect example of, you know, how the two had to be, had to work together, um, and the fact that this option wasn't presented, then you could put him in the category of, you, you could, you could, um, you know, limit your advice in such a way that a different policy outcome results. And if you're ever having that kind of effect on policy, then that's not, that's not your role. Now, that's not to say, you know, but in this day and age, we have these war colleges and everybody's getting this strategic political education. You know, it's good to a point. But you have to understand, you know, 
the limits of that. And it's great to be in these circles. And that's what I do. I'm from our department where we do that, you know, our strategy and policy department. And I was thinking, you know, our goal is that you're going to get in those forums and you're going to, you know, you're going to hold your own against those civilians. And they're going to know that they're going to see you know what you're talking about. You understand enough about the political strategic environment. But that doesn't mean you're ever going to get to make decisions in that environment. But you're, you're, you're going to operate in that environment. And you're going to, uh, those, those roles, those worlds overlap enough. And that's why there's civilians studying here, because they want to learn about the military. And the, the goal is at that top level, we have people working together where their expertise overlaps. But when you get beyond that overlapping level, you're dependent on their, what's unique about their role and their competency. With the, with the civilians, they're going to have to be more politically astute and they've got to worry about other things. Okay, um, and the military, we were, then they get into all this operational expertise and technical knowledge that, you know, the civilians don't really want to waste any time learning all that. But the important thing is they, at the nexus, they can talk to each other. <clears throat> Over here. I'm absolutely fascinated mm -hmm. by this idea of constitutional multiple masters for best military advice, because if we follow that a little bit farther than you took it, I think we might be getting at the root of why this is so confusing to us right now. Constitutionally, the sovereign is the American people. So is there a responsibility to provide the best military advice to the Mer American people that folks like General McChrystal are living up to when they answer the question in a public forum, uh, will this work? Or is that a cop-out? If we look down that line, we may actually be seeing an issue of a conflict, a growing conflict between our Republican little r traditions and our Democrat little d traditions that is empowered by the reach of the media and the form that public participation and governance is start, starting to take now rather than any deficiency in the professional military ethics. Okay, great, great topic because that's one of the things I usually do like to address when I'm talking about professional norms is the whole relationship with society, you know, there's lots of things to think about with that, um, and specifically the relationship with the media. Uh, but at first you brought up this idea of the people and, and this and that. I mean, I would argue that obviously the co Congress is, they are the representatives of the people, you know, especially when we're talking about the House, the, the entity closest to the people. Uh, and so when you're a, you know, and, and that's representative government. I mean, that's the whole, you know, idea of the republic is that the people aren't there voting, okay? They're setting their representatives to vote. And so we do want to make sure they're informed and making the best decisions they can. Now, the, the question is, when you're talking about, because it brings up, now you're bringing up, really, we're going to get into retired officers, too, indirectly. Because you, you bring up, for instance, General McChrystal, or any active general, okay? And if he's the guy who's the center of, of the issue um, right now, He's got to be very careful how um, he plays that role. And so on the one hand, I think he should be careful not to be perceived as uh, a member of the administration in the extreme sense, you know, that I just work for them, okay? Um, and to keep, but, and also keep in mind his responsibility um, to the Congress. Now on the other hand, what about talking to the people in public forums? Now there, a lot of it depends, that's, that's the whole timing issue. I mean, no one's gonna say, because there's another whole issue, another issue that brings up, and that's this whole question of the civil military gap. Again, because of the all-volunteer force, because there's so small percentage of the American population that actually is, has been in the military, who has any association with the military, you've got a large gap where um, the public is widely not informed um, about these issues. So I am a big advocate for the military educating the public, but you have to be careful how you do it. And that's why I think this is, that's a good role for retirees. I, I think, I mean, I've had a lot of students over the years who say, oh, I really hate those talking heads on the, on, you know, CNN or whatever it is. And I'm like, well, it depends. Depends how they play it. 
you know, if they're out there and if they're just saying, you know, if they're just sharing their expertise so that the American public can better understand something they know very little about, I'm all for that. I say they're uniquely qualified to do that. I mean, it's the nature of the military profession is that you kick people out at the height of their profession. You know, when they're in there, even if they go down to be four-star generals, I mean, they're still in their 50s. They've got tons of expertise, but, you know, they would still be CEOs anywhere else. We say, nope, going to retirement. Okay, so fine. So I, I am all for that education role for them. What, where it becomes problematic is when they, um, that goes back to this partisan issue, if they then start, they don't remain neutral, and they start to take a side. And they say, well, I am the Republican general, and I am the Democratic general. And, and again, in a perfect world, if I go back to my roles and responsibilities, you know, in all these campaigns, I'd say, hey, campaigns, stay away from that. Because you don't understand, you know, if anything, from doing this talk, it, it, it helped me really kind of separate when, when you're trying to develop competencies with among all these actors in civil military relations, the military itself, Congress, president, media, the people, all that. And I say, well, I would want them to know, first of all, their constitutional foundations, which they don't know very well, which is evident. And I also want them to know something about officership and the profession. So I would say to these people running the campaigns, you know, you don't understand the profession. Don't try to use these people in a political way. Don't even put them up to it. And, 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 if, the, and if the military, if, if the actors, military actors were smart, they know it's not about them. It's not about General Cook. Admiral Cook, since you're at the, at the uh, Naval War College, they don't care about you. I mean, they don't. You know, you, they make they make make you feel like, oh, we really need you. Your expertise is so important. Come join our side. You know, they just want you know another admiral on the stage. And and what they're really shooting for is this gamesmanship and say, I have more admirals than you have. And so, see, candidate X, the military's for candidate X. Okay, so you know that's another whole issue. We can talk about in seminar or whatever. So it's. Again, one thing leads to the other, and you have to be. And if you understand the roles and responsibilities, you kind of know when to limit your behavior. So, getting back to McChrystal, when he got in trouble, remember during those Afghan deliberations because he went to London and he gave that talk to I, IS, and I was like, well, okay, but you know, and I would, I, I, in my opinion, I'd say that'd be okay after the announcement was made, but should have known that anything he said. Would get you would be perceived as oh this is what the general thinks, at a time when the administration was cranking through, and I'm sure he was making all those points you know behind closed doors, and it was just something that I that you know in a perfect world I I, I would like to see that not happen let let them understand that you know there's some fallout from that, okay there's a price to be paid. Um, because now, you know, there's that trust factor. Did he just make a mistake, or is he going to be a guy that always does this? I mean, why, why? I wouldn't want to be the general in that position, you know? And I, I, honestly, I don't think it was anything deliberate. I just think he was kind of naive about it. And, and the media, of course, and it has to do with just even the nature of the media, you know, that's 24-7 news cycle. I mean, they're going to jump on that, and that's going to be the news. So that's why I think it's so important, you know, that we begin to... Um, you know, sort of unpack all the little pieces that go with, you know, understanding the roles and responsibilities and why the symposium is such a good thing. So I think, I think one more question. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Hi, I'm Art Weber, retired Marine officer. When the balance between the civil and military is dysfunctional, and I would describe it that way in the Vietnam War, particularly in a book by Masters in Dereliction mm -hmm. of Duty, when the Joint Chiefs were effectively isolated from the National Command Authority. What are the consequences of that, and how does the military operate? And let's fast forward to Mr. Rumsfeld's dysfunctional reign, and what kind of an environment he put military leadership in, and what's the ultimate cost of that? Wow, what a great final question, because I think it brings us back full circle. As I as I try to, you know, bring across in the talk, I don't know how effectively, but this idea that, you know, when I do my other writing in civil military relations, I always try to bring it back to, you know, good civil military relations. Um, another way of saying it is, you know, effective civil military partnerships, um, healthy civil military relations, whatever you want to call it, gets you better strategic outcomes. 
when you start interjecting this dysfunction or that dysfunction, you know, you're only going to pay for that. You're going to pay for that and, you know, the a bad execution of a decision, you, you know, decisions going to be made that probably shouldn't have been made, um, a strategy is going to get adapted too late. I mean, whatever it is, you're going to pay for that. And that goes back to, you know, this point of sustaining the democratic values. You know, your, 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 your republic will be less, lesser because of that. So that's why I think this is so important. It's not just about being bright and, you know, getting points, style points for somebody being, you know, more um, by the book than someone else. I mean, I think there really are real strategic consequences. And we have plenty of examples now. And I think if you go back and you look at our strategic failures, you're probably going to find some issue in civil military relations there. And that's why it's, 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 it's worth it to study the cases and not to repeat uh, history if, if we can avoid it. 